and welcome to Educating Global Citizens, the opportunities and challenges of living in Asia. And we're delighted to welcome our panel today. We have with us Joe Roberts and Michael Perry of the European International School of Ho Chi Minh City. We also have Robert Stitch, Garden International School in Kuala Lumpur, and Paul Wilson joining us from Singapore, Brighton College, Singapore. So welcome to you all. Lovely to see you today. So let's first hear from each of you individually just what type of school you have, where it is and the age of the children. So shall we start with you, Robert, please? Okay, good morning to the UK. This is good evening from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, I'm principal of GIS, Garden International School. We're a through school from EYC all the way to pre-university A-level. Uh, we're about 2,000 students, 64 different nationalities. Uh, we're a school that is almost 70 years old. Next year we'll be 70 years old. So we're a British international school, IGCSE and an A-level at the top end of the school. Thank you, that's great. So Paul, you're sitting next to Robert in the, the way I'm seeing the view, so we'll start with you please. Um, tell us a little bit about Brighton College Singapore. Thank you, Fiona. Yes, good morning, everyone um, in the UK. Um, so Brighton College Singapore is a very new school, uh, literally just three months old. Um, so we're a prep school. We cater for children from 18 months up to 11 years old. We follow the British curriculum, so early years foundation stage at pre-nursery, nursery and reception, then moving on to the national curriculum uh, for years one to year six. Um, like our uh, prep school in the UK, we're academically selective. Uh, we seek to provide an ambitious and challenging education, but we deliver that in a, a small nurturing environment. So even at capacity, uh, we we'll have a maximum of three classes per year group. Uh, so uh, the school on its full will be 550. Uh, we're currently uh, have children of just 50 children at the school in the moment, uh, but um, our trajectory is obviously <laughs> hopefully over the next few years to, to fill uh, the school as a whole. Oh, very exciting, a new school, wonderful. Right, and then delighted to welcome Joe Roberts and Michael Perry, who are both from the European International School in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City. And I had the privilege to uh, visit the school uh, at the end of last year. But do tell us a, a little about it um, as we go along. So Joe, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about the school? Yeah, good morning everyone in the UK. My name's Jo Roberts. I'm the Head of Early Years and Primary at the European School in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, we're quite a bit younger uh, than the Garden School in Kuala Lumpur, but quite a bit older uh, than Brighton College um, in Singapore. So this is actually our 10th um, year anniversary. Uh, we are a K-12 school, um, children from two years old up to 18. And we run the IB Baccalaureate, uh, three programs. We're a continuum school, running the primary years program, the middle years program, and uh, the diploma program. Um, around about 560 students um, currently. Uh, so big uh, and not too small. Mm, great, thank you. And Michael, um, what's your role at the school, please? So I'm the PYP coordinator, so uh, very curriculum focused and just really looking at the learning that happens within our school. Good, great. So we've got a nice mix of curriculums there. So maybe we'll um, kick off with this sort of bigger, bigger yeah. question. So what do you think it means to be a global citizen? So this is wide reaching, but young people coming into an international school um, and I feel personally come away with some huge opportunities for life. So perhaps we can just start with you, Joe. I mean, what do you think it means from very tiny little children that you've got yours uh, and all the way through early years? What does it mean and how do you start them off on this exciting journey? Um, I think one of the main things about uh, global citizenship is seeing the perspective of other um so being aware that um there are differences but that doesn't make them wrong 
uh, and that we, the celebration of diversity, I guess, and um, inclusiveness. Um, and I think for uh, children at our school, certainly, <clears throat> they um, come into an environment um, that is very inclusive because they, they start off um, and every one of their classmates and their teachers are from different parts of the world and coming with a different perspective, uh, different cultures and different traditions. So it's very easy or much easier for um, students in an international school to understand the concept of one humanity as opposed to different nations, I think, in a nutshell. Uh, obviously, it's a much bigger thing than that, but I think really uh, it's really about the perspective of others and respecting different uh, opinions. Mm, great. Um, so what about um, you, Robert? Um, you've had a lot of experience over many years um, and a full age range of children. I mean, how do you um, instill this sense of global citizenship across different age ranges? Yeah, I mean, I would support what's been said, but here you know, I think it's about an awareness, it's about caring, uh, it's about embracing cultural differences, diversity. I think it's about uh, promoting responsibility and social justice around our, our student body. I, I, I always like to use the phrase of think global, act local. So, I mean, we at, at GIS are uh, an international school in Malaysia, so we are international and, and proudly Malaysian. So I think we've been in a, such a school as GIS is a great privilege and our students know that and have a responsibility to to, to help those less fortunate than themselves. And that's part of the culture of the school and the values of the school, which are embedded through you know, our mission and vision and our expectations of not just our students, but our staff and our, and our parent body as well. So um, you know, I think this is a very, very important conversation and you know, all good schools embrace global citizenship, sure. And your your um, senior pupils, when they're moving on, do they tend to go around the world, or do they tend to stick in Malaysia? What's and is there a great uh, wide alumni? Uh, yeah, we have we have an, an incredible alumni um, and very very successful. We got six students into Oxbridge this this year, and a number of students into to Ivy League. Uh, so our students go go all around the world. Many of them go to the UK, but increasingly we've got students going to, to the US and to, to Canada and top universities around the world. And that hopefully they carry with them that sense of global citizenship, which is certainly part, part of the journey at, at Garden International School. Brilliant, thank you. So um, over to you then, uh, Paul, um, and you're starting on this path, uh, and you, your your own background. I think um, you're quite a global citizen yourself, and you've uh, come from a, a different area, um, and you you speak uh, Mandarin, and uh, I think you were in uh, from an accountancy background. Was that right originally? Yes. So you're you're the sort of global citizen that the sound come into teaching and the world of international education so you've got a slightly different perspective on things and now excitingly um growing a school in singapore so what what's your sort of take on global citizenship yeah so uh, absolutely agree it's um uh, a really key feature of any international school and something where you're you feel you're giving enormous value to the children in your school um, I think one of the things, like as we're setting up a school, that's obviously very key is uh, getting the culture right. Um, so those yeah, that, that principles of inclusivity. Uh, but uh, one of our core values here is is kindness. And I think when you um, create a safe place uh, for children in a school, um, and they have that that ethos of kindness to each other. Um, it just enables all of those differences to be regarded as really positive things and things to uh, to uh, celebrate and, and and cherish in each other. Um, and they they just learn to uh, almost without thinking. It's so normalised uh, when you're here um, at any of our schools with a mix of uh, they they'll have a whole range of nationalities within each class. So it becomes the most normal thing to be making friends with. Uh, someone from Japan, someone from Korea, someone from Sweden, 
and without thinking, actually, um, they they are becoming global citizens and able to um, communicate across cross cultures. And I think the, the the thing the school does is create that environment where that's seen as a very positive thing to enable those uh, relationships, to, those positive relationships to happen. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Michael, so you're um, an IB school, um, but tell us about, well, IB and how that um, personifies really a lot of the global um, uh, Yeah, I, I think as everybody said, it really has to be embedded in the mission and uh, vision of the school and the values that you create as a school. It really has to be there. And I guess from the educational side, and when you think about curriculum and planning, you really need to think about the knowledge and understanding and skills and values and attitudes that you can embed. So really looking at things like we've said before, like social justice and equity, um, looking at conflict, human rights, making that part of what we do, we do with the students and moving on to skills, to looking at their communication skills, that real self-awareness, um, reflection and empathy and move on to how we teach attitudes to the children. So looking at self-esteem and how we can embed that commitment to social justice in what we do as a school. And really, I think as uh, Paul said, looking at diversity, how do we value that as a school to show that this is what we want you to do when you leave? And so I think through curriculum, we can actually have the children walk away uh, with an education that's really very well rounded and has given them the actual skills to go out into the world and embed it in what they do and how they interact with people. Mm, great, thank you. So you were mentioning um, earlier there in your comments, Paul, you were talking about the wider community. Um, and so perhaps you can just touch on that a bit more. Um, so the parent community and the community that you're surrounded by in Singapore, um, how does that impact on the school? Yeah, sure. And I think um, so when we talk about kindness, one aspect of that is, yeah, sure, within the school community. Uh, but um, it's it's very much an out, outward uh, looking perspective as well as as, as Rob was saying. Um, and I think um, it's great to have, I guess, in international schools, they're very privileged environments. And I think it's uh, really uh, important to um, take the children outside this often very nice bubble but take them outside that bubble so that they are interacting with local communities here in Singapore wherever they are based um, and something that's a lovely development really in education um, that children have become uh, very uh, keen advocates of, of things like uh, the environment, animal welfare. And so you're tapping into uh, passions that are often there, actually. And, and then you're just uh, giving, you know, going alongside them, but helping them to, uh, I guess, be creative and thinking of ways, how can you make a difference? So as well as making them aware of issues and then increasing their knowledge of some of these issues, um, it's, it's really exciting to think even in a primary setting, what can we do to make them see that they have agency to make a difference, uh, even at a young age? So beginning that journey of, of being an active citizen and a volunteer. Um, and there, there are simple things you can do, like in Singapore, uh, a beach is not far away, so you can do uh, beach cleanups. Um, we have a wonderful zoo here, um, and they do a special scheme for children where they can go in. Um, get trained up and actually been a, a zoo tour guide and give little mini tours to younger children. So um, there are there are things you can find just to make these children feel that, yeah, actually, they're significant uh, human beings who can make a difference even at this early age. Yeah. And early years, um, Joe, um, and you have very tiny children. Is it is it the age of three? They they start uh, two, actually, two. So from younger children then, so how do you start sharing this wonderful environment, geographical environment as well, that um, you're privileged to be uh, living and working in? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think even with the, the really little ones, I mean, I think as adults, sometimes we, we forget um, that children have great capacity uh, and they have great understanding of things, more, more so capable of more than possibly we, we think they are. Um, so even at very young ages, um, you know, they go out, they go on field trips, they go shopping, they go, you know, they go and see the, the community outside of, um, I guess, like 
uh, Paul was talking about the, the, the bubble uh, that they live in. Um, and for students at our school, um, you know, the campus is, is glorious and it's very leafy and it's, it's lots of villas and swimming pools and, uh, you know, it's very beautiful, but they can go outside um, two minutes down the road and they, they can see um, extreme poverty. Uh, you know, so they are very aware, I think, or become aware um, as they get older uh, about the disparity uh, between the privilege they have and, and what they see um, outside um, of that. And I think our children, I think children in general, um, they're very passionate uh, about injustice, uh, about fairness. You know, even at a very young age, you know, it's like, they understand that it's not fair, uh, you know, in social circumstances. Well, that's not fair. He's got that. Why haven't I got that? So they very much understand uh, the unfairness and the injustice and what they don't understand why. Uh, and I think um, it's our job, I think, as, as educators to be, um, I think Michael mentioned it uh, the other day about being educators being agents of change. Um, and I, and I think, you know, with the young minds and they're very passionate, they have access to a great deal more than I guess as youngsters we ever did. They see a lot more, they have access to much more. Um, and I think the voice and the agency um, that Paul mentioned is, is absolutely imperative um, that schools foster that so that children believe that they can make a difference. Um, you know, and, and, and that is, is something that we strive very much for at our school to ensure that our children are given um, that voice uh, and that agency so that they know uh, that even their little actions can make a difference and they can make a difference. Great, thank you. So these environmental issues and science and STEM, except for Michael in the uh, curriculum that presumably there's plenty of opportunity for that to come across and pl plus sort of plug into the natural environment that's around as well as the sort of science um and then, yeah i think um, yes carry on yes no i think one of the benefits of uh bib is that really it's the idea of transdisciplinary learning so everything's embedded um in our units so really we we don't strive to say we're learning about science now we're learning about literacy now we really try to create sort of the real world within the classrooms and knowing that nothing, there's no such thing as subjects. Subjects are really just a made up thing. So really going for those high end concepts that students can see. And even at a young age, even with the two year olds, you know, being clear that what is action for these children? How can they make a difference? Um, what can they observe and how can they make change? So I think we really have to um, bring the outside world to them and allow them to see it from their perspective instead of trying to push what sometimes what we're told that we should we should see so um, as we move up really allowing the kids to take action within the school outside of the school and sometimes it can be as simple as you know a student deciding to annoy their parents and say they want to put a bucket in the shower now to catch all the leftover water because we've been learning about this and I think you know, we have to embrace that because they're showing us they do want to make a difference. And I think that's one of the most important things we can do is show them they do have power. I think that that is probably one of the most powerful things. Yes, great. And then uh, the parents as well. Um, we were having a brief chat before, weren't we, Robert, about um, how parents um, gain such a lot from being in this part of the world. Um, and can support the children as well, uh, both in their attitudes, but also um, seeing a different side of the region and the country. Um, can you just sort of expand on what it's like for parents and families to come into the region and how um, they might benefit? Yeah, just to expand a little bit further as well on the on the whole um, aspect of, of of service and responsibility before I talk about the parents. I think, you know, there's a lot of really interesting points that have been made. And I think it's for, for us at, at GIS, service learning is an integral part of the, the fabric of, of the school. And if you get service learning right, it really does change the philosophy of the school. So one of the things that, that we do well at GIS is, is um, 
work with the local community and our, our charity projects are really not charity projects they're service projects and it's partnerships partnering with uh, less fortunate parts of the community be the refugees or school for the blind or whatever it is we have these these really deep service projects where the the students are actively engaged in supporting so fundraising supports service and it's a, a genuine partnership and i think when you get that right it really does change the culture of, of the school um and i think there's a lot of really interesting points that have been raised so far and i think we all support that as, as being part of the philosophy part of the mission and vision and it really speaks to the values the true values of the school that we're living in practice uh, in everything that we do but just you know for for, for us as well we we, we advertise ourselves and market ourselves as a genuine learning community and by that we 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 engage all of our stakeholder groups so the learning community is not just about the student body it's about our staff of course but it's about our parents and engaging them on that particular journey of the school so that they support everything that we're doing in terms of the values so our, our, our parents are, are heavily involved in those those service projects that i've talked about um, and you know, through parent workshops, through actually running CCA programs, which are, are linked to those those kind of projects with refugees, etc. Everybody sort of buys into that mission and vision and the culture of the school. Um, but in terms of of, of where we are, uh, KL is a, is is a great great city. It's a, it's a world class city in a, a beautiful country. So relocation to to, to KL. I, I lived in Hong Kong for fifteen years. And moving moving to KL was pretty seamless. It's a it's a great world city, but you can travel. It's it's a, it's a large large country uh, with with beautiful beaches and mountains. Cameron Highlands, Penang, over to the east coast, and beautiful resorts. And the great thing about KL is you can get in your car and drive. And uh, you know, again, I said said earlier, we're international and proudly Malaysian. When I when I first went into international international education. Uh, I, I was in some of the schools which were, trips were going all over the world and uh, taking their, their, their kids all over the world. Our trips are all within Malaysia. So that again speaks to our values that we don't, we don't go overseas. We explore the country and the beauty of the country with, with, with our student body. Uh, and that's obviously what our parents do as well. And you can presumably tap into uh, the resources of the parents as well. So they must have a lot of knowledge, uh, but also partnering the school that you can really make a difference in the local community or make these trips, as you say, really happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have some examples of that perhaps uh, with EIS? Um, but also perhaps we could talk about the sort of cultural uh, areas and the the things that you do that do sort of cel celebrate this um, global citizens so you often have in international schools international days and you celebrate local holidays and different uh, the cultures that are represented in the school um, can you describe just some of those and why they're important and how they also involve the parents as as well as the wider community Oh, me. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. No, I mean, I, I think as in, uh, in many international schools, most international schools, we celebrate diversity, we celebrate our community. Uh, at EIS, we, we call ourselves an educational village. Um, the campus itself is uh, made up of uh, villas, which were family homes, have now been um, changed into classrooms so you might be teaching in a bedroom or a, what was once a kitchen uh, so the campus very much lends itself to that village feel uh, and of course the parent community is is very much part of that um, i guess um for the last um i don't know can't remember how long it's since march really unfortunately due to covid um we haven't been allowed to have parents on campus uh so some of the support that parents used to be able to give us you know doing events and all that kind of thing they haven't been able to join us uh for so much this year uh but we've still been celebrating the events in the in, in whatever way we can so i think this year already i think in 
three months we've been back, we've had National Day, which celebrates the National Day of Vietnam. Uh, and everybody in the school dresses in the traditional clothes of Vietnam. Um, we have an assembly, normally with parents, but this year not. Um, oh gosh, National Day. I think uh, we have a, a, a women, um, Women's Day, which is like... Uh, uh, yeah, we have, that hasn't come up yet. We had United Nations Day, so I think it was the, the UN's 75th um, anniversary, I believe. Um, so we celebrated the UN Day as well. Um, Halloween, <laughs> you know, we, you know, all the different, all the different. We celebrate, you know, uh, as many things as we as we can. Uh, but you know, Moon Festival, all different things, and, and celebrate the diversity of our our community is incredibly important. And sharing tradition, sharing food. Um, sharing stories, you know, uh, parents come in and, and, and share stories about their their traditions and, and all those kind of things. So it's very much, it's just integral to what we do. Uh, you know, we celebrate different languages, we celebrate, you know, different foods, different cultures, uh, different traditions. So it's it's a daily part of life um, at EIS, as I, I think in most international schools who have a, a very you know, lots of different nationalities uh, in one in one spot. Right, thank you. So we've touched on, on culture. Um, now, language, um, you must have lots of different languages spoken. And so how do you keep up children's um, um, language skills? I mean, you're teaching in English, all of you, um, but how do you support um, other languages that the children may speak and or help welcome uh, families who maybe don't have such strong uh, English language. So how do you um, cope with bilingual and multilingual families and help them to transition into the school environment? Um, shall we start with, well, shall we go over to you, Michael, just on the, for the formal thing of actual uh, curriculum and lessons and how many um, languages you teach and then sort of widen out the discussion. Sure, so we, um, I think you, even before you think about languages you teach, you really have to think about valuing home language and the diversity of home languages within the school. Um, so we teach, as a European school, German and French are our two European languages. Um, obviously we have Vietnamese as well, so, and every student is uh, exposed to Vietnamese for our Vietnamese nationals. Obviously, they learn uh, uh, first language Vietnamese, but we have language acquisition for all of our students because I really think if you are going to value the, uh, the community that you live in, you actually need some functional language within that so you can actually interact with people. So that's a, a big thing for us is that idea of um, host nation studies and really understanding how we have similarities and differences within the place that we live. Students are very lucky here. We also have the opportunity that if you choose to study the home language, we can help facilitate that. Um, we have parents come and teach sometimes. And uh, the idea of that language, we learn through language. Uh, we learn about language and we learn how to use a language. And I think we need to stress that you know, every single person here brings something different to the community with their language as well. So parents come in, they may read stories in their home language to a class. We translate that as well so the kids in the classroom can say, oh, that's different, similar stories, we're the same. And I think also when parents come and even visit our school, we have uh, many multilingual staff that can speak a range of languages. So. You know, you are welcome to our school a lot of the time in your home language and the children could see that we're valuing that. And I think you need to put that at the forefront of what you do. Um, yes, we teach in the medium of English. English isn't the language that we all, you know, there's many successful people around the world that don't speak English. It's not an imperative thing. We obviously want to use English to give you opportunities that maybe you don't have. But that's okay. Your language is just as important as my home language. And I think that's something that you, people need to feel when they come into a school. Great. Thank you. So, Paul, um, you're a linguist yourself. Um, so can you give us um, your views on uh, languages and how you teach those at Brighton College? 
and you know yeah, I, I think um you know yeah, um, sorry, Fiona. Yeah, I think it's um, with, with our schools with uh, primary as aspects to it, um, language doesn't often really uh, take off uh, in England till secondary level. And I think uh, being able to uh, emphasize that and invest in it at a primary level, you really reap the benefits from that. Um, and it's uh, you know, typical in international schools, so that does happen. Um, we've got a, a dual language uh, model here at Brighton. Um, so we have class Oh dear, sorry. Oh, we seem to have lost the um, call temporarily. Um, perhaps Robert, you could step in and talk until we get Paul back um, on languages. And yeah, of course. So um, obviously we're an English medium school and for, for students coming in that have English as a second language, we have very good provision to support those students through our ESL program, superb program at, at GIS. We also promote the, the, the host language, Bahasa, which is taught Malay, which is taught through, throughout the school, uh, either as first language or second language, which is obviously part of our, our cultural mission of being, as I say, international and proudly Malaysian. Uh, we have Mandarin streams as well within the school, and then obviously modern foreign um, European languages. We have uh, French uh, and Spanish in, in, in the secondary school. I think it goes without saying an international school needs to be promoting, um, you know, bilingualism, even trilingualism. It's such an important skill in the 21st century. And if our, if our students are, are coming out of, of the education in our schools, being bilingual or trilingual, it's going to give them such... Uh, a big advantage in, in the 21st century. Um, so thank you very much, Robert. Um, back to you then, Paul. You were, sorry, <laughs> cut off. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. No, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's just, just mentioning how you can create that lovely environment where they're learning without realising they're learning. And at that age, you know, pre-prep age, they, they just soak it all up and it's, it's brilliant. Um, and as Rob was saying that, you know, our context here is, is very special. If you learn languages in England, and even uh, if you learn French, um, you're like, oh, okay, this is a bit, um, it's nice, but I don't really see the point. When, when we're here, you're, you're learning a language, you can go outside the school gates, and you can be interacting with local people using that language. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is amazing. I can actually uh, see it for a child. They get, they get it. Um, and when we're at school, um, uh, I try and talk to the TAs in Mandarin uh, when I'm feeling confident. And uh, again, they're seeing, oh, yeah, even someone who's white is able to engage in this uh, in this um, uh, in the, a common language that's different from English. And it's sort of, um, it's sort of it's obvious that that can happen, but for a young child, sometimes they they need to see it in reality to get get the whole point. So it just feels um, an incredible opportunity, really. Uh, and it's something you, when you talk to parents, they're very excited when they've moved to Singapore and into Asia that their children do get these opportunities in these schools to learn other languages. Um, and it's uh, an incredible gift. Um, and uh, yeah, that whole uh, getting it, so it's not just classrooms uh, teaching, but it's the environment within the schools where you're having dual language, uh, bilingual approaches. Um, it, uh, it's a great way of, uh, of, of learning a language. Um, yeah, so it's a wonderful thing that our schools offer. And Joe, what are the secrets, do you think, of uh, getting uh, young children to be able to speak fluently in other languages? I think, you know, what Paul touched upon really, uh, it, it's about children being able to make connections. It's about context. Uh, you know, it, if it helps them, if it's something that they want to do, if it's fun, if it's interactive, if there's a reason to do it, uh, I think is really important. If there's a reason and if they can see uh, the benefits, uh, I, I think that that really helps. And, and here, you know, when, when children in, in all our schools because there's so many uh, children and families speaking so many different languages, they can see, the, they have the context, they, they can make the connection. 
uh, like, you know, um, in the UK, when I learned French for 11 years, uh, and I would struggle to get by uh, in France, because I could never, there was never any, it made no sense, really, uh, because it was too displaced, I think, whereas here, the, the kids can see the value of language and the value of being able to, to speak different languages. So I think if children can see a reason why, uh, then it makes it a reasonable thing for them to do. Be like, okay, if, then I can speak, I can play here, I can do this. So I, I think the why uh, is incredibly important and what kids have in an international context is the why. And I suppose for children as well, the why of keeping up two languages could be because um, extended family, uh, when they're on a Zoom call or or even at home, um, may not speak English and they may be speaking in a third language. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a parent arriving at, at your schools, so that's all of all of, all of you. This this question. So. Um, are there any opportunities to support the parents as well? Does, is that something that your Parent Teachers Association would help with? Um, and uh, how do you build up confidence as well for the parents to feel part of the school community and able to also support the native languages at home and perhaps third languages for the children at home? You want to just start again with that, Joe? Sure. Uh, I mean, as, as Michael mentioned, um, we have um, a lot of different nationalities. Our staff can speak, I think it's around about 39 different languages. Um, and also we utilize our parent community. If we have new families coming in, uh, if they're from a particular area or they speak a particular language, uh, we will ask them to come in uh, and maybe meet and do a school tour with the parent or, you know, just by email if they've got any questions and feel, you know, don't feel comfortable um, in, in English um, particularly. Um, so we use um, whoever we've got actually really, you know, then it's uh, for, for new parents coming in. I think we support them very well. I don't think we've yet the language that we can't support them in, in some capacity. Uh, whether it we use our students as well our older students as well i mean some of our, our students are translators for their parents um so you know we do our best to accommodate um for parents who, you know who don't speak uh english as a common language and we use our community to help support them brilliant thank you and is that the same for you rob in malaysia yeah, I mean, GIS is a real community school, and one of the things we re really pride ourselves on is induction of uh, new members into the community. So, be those students, uh, staff, or parents. In in fact, of course, we won the relocation uh, award for 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 our our, suc our success in this particular area. So, we do lots of things in terms of um, inducting the the new community and our parent body. Uh, the we have workshops, we have weekly workshops going on, sometimes two or three a week. We have support for languages uh, going on, particularly English as a second language. Uh, we're starting to think about doing some additional language support uh, in 2021. So lots of, lots of things going on there to make sure that these new families coming into the school really feel engaged and part of the community. Um, I think it's, it's sort of an integral part of the school the community. Thank you. So all this has been wonderfully positive and a great example of how your schools are uh, a shining light in your community and uh, in your area. But we've all been struck by the COVID pandemic and the Im impact and the implications. So I think it's worth just touching on, on that now. Um, how did you respond? What did you think were the challenges? And then also, what were the positives possibly that came out of it? Um, advances in technology or new innovations or communications. Um, what about, um, let's throw you in at the deep end, Paul, because you had just arrived at taking over leadership of the school um, and to be plunged into a pandemic situation. So a lot on your plate. So <laughs> how 
how did uh, the school and yourself rise to the challenge? Uh, yes, yeah, so when when it, when it struck uh, initially, we were in our startup stage, so getting the ready the school ready for the August opening. Um, and when it happened, I was watching my sister schools uh, here in Singapore. Uh, uh, you know, having it was a huge, huge undertaking. Um, and I was thinking, thank goodness, <laughs> I'm not having to live through that. Uh, but yeah, there, it lasted longer than I expected. So we we also had to step up when we opened. Um, we yeah, we were very fortunate that by that stage, uh, a lot of the processes were very clear. Um, the Singaporean government has been incredibly successful in uh, communicating very clearly, having very effective measures um, that the population have followed very closely. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it, we were yeah, we were in a, actually we benefited from knowing what we were entering into. I think uh, the stresses on management around for schools around the world was having to scramble from an established position to all of a sudden someone saying, actually, now your specialist teacher can only teach two classes. Uh, uh, and then you, you, you're left with a, a pretty enormous um, logistical problem. Um, so, yeah, we were actually um, very fortunate. <laughs> um, and uh, in Singapore now, since we've started, uh, no home learning. And again, um, my colleagues on this call will have gone through a lot uh, as uh, all the schools around the world have had to uh, embrace that new way of learning. We've been very fortunate again that the situation in Singapore has meant we've uh, been able to teach normally uh, face to face. Uh, we do have some restrictions, uh, but they're not uh, onerous. Um, so uh, actually, Fiona, <laughs> in a way, uh, I've still got more hair than I would have done otherwise. But um, yeah, we, we, um, we've been uh, quite a, a smoother ride than a, a lot of schools, actually. And Michael, was it up to you to be getting all, all your curriculum and courses online? Uh, I think it was everybody, you know, I think as a, it's a really a moment in time that I think everyone realised we are a community. There was, you know, there's that worry of how do we stay connected, you know, we got told on Sunday night that you're not going back to school after this holiday and of course, every teacher in the world, I think, went, woohoo, another week of holidays. We don't get this very often in life. And then it set in and that, that, I think that gloom for teachers was exactly what parents were feeling at home. Nobody knew what, what this was, how it was going to affect us. So, you know, the first thing was how do we stay connected with students? Because, you know, most teachers don't sign up to be behind a computer if we wonder how people sit at a desk all day. Now, how do they do that? That's not what we do. We are active. We're up and moving with the children. So I think it was a big learning curve for every single teacher, administrator across the world because a lot of us weren't trained in how to do this. So we tried new uh, software. How do we engage with the students so that they can actually participate in learning? Um, it was really difficult. As we tried new things, and I think we, you have to be really transparent with the parents about, hey, we're all learning this together, and you have to understand that parents had to stop working and stay at home. And I think obviously from an early years and primary perspective, that means the parents sort of replacing that teacher. They're not as independent at two years old as a 17-year-old is doing their diploma program. So um, we had to be flexible parents we had to offer a mix of synchronous and asynchronous learning and I think uh, what was successful for us was just we had school challenges that we would have weekly challenges that the children could participate in we were sending resources home to families that didn't have things so that they could use them at home we had a virtual sports day where the teachers actually from wherever they were some of them locked in their apartments that they couldn't leave some were able to go for a walk and you know film these challenges for the children for sports day so i think the the takeaway is just keeping that connection and keeping that you know that village feel that we try to instill every day how can we make that happen in the class in oh, sorry, online instead of in the classroom thank you and robert what was it like for you the impact of COVID and how easy was it to get uh, the school and the teaching online? Uh, well, I've been in education for 35 years in the teaching profession for 35 years, 17 years in, in, in leadership, senior leadership position and, and nothing compares to, to, to 2020. It's just been 
uh, unbelievable, extraordinary year. I mean, I, I was in Hong Kong during SARS, but SARS was nothing like this. I mean, we're closed for maybe three or four weeks and then we're, we're back open again. Um, so I think we knew that there was something amiss really at, at, at the beginning of, of, of the new year. Uh, certainly coming up to Chinese New Year, we were starting to think that, you know, this was going to be serious and we were putting plans in place to get our continuity of learning home learning uh, provision up to up to uh, the level that we um, we could support our students in the best way possible. And then we closed it. We closed down in March and we've gone through various stages of a fairly severe, restrictive um, close closed down lockdown in, in March to the opening up of the economy. Um, and then in August, we opened up for, for all students again uh, with SOPs in place. And the SOPs were incredible. I mean, we, we really wanted to get all of our 2,000 kids back in at the same time, which is a logistical uh, exercise in itself. It was like D-Day every day, getting the kids in and out of school, just in terms of the exit and social distancing, etc. So, and then, of course, we've now gone in, in KL, unfortunately, gone back into to lockdown again. So we, we've gone through different phases. Uh, and we're back, back now in continuity of learning. So it has been an incredible journey, but I think some of the things that have been mentioned here, what, has actually, what we've actually seen is the power of the community coming together. And I, and I actually think that we are now a stronger community because of, 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 of COVID-19. And that's one of the benefits that we've seen during this dreadful, dreadful year. And how have we done that? Well, I think it's, again, some of the things that have been mentioned. Communication has been absolutely critical to the, the success of how we've dealt with, with COVID-19. Clear, concise communication, centralized communication at many times, making sure that you know, our parents, our students, our staff are not getting conflicting messages. So we think very, very carefully and clearly about uh, the, the, those communications and decisive decision making when, when it has to be made. And I, I have to say that you know, the ways in, that many international schools have, have acted could be a template for governments around the world because they have not done it anywhere near as successfully as we've done it as school, school leaders around, around the world. So that's bring, you know, that communication, I think, has brought the, the community together. The other thing I would say is every single school, when they went into to lockdown, had a continuity of learning program, which wasn't as good as it is now. Uh, everybody has improved their system. And how have we, how have we all done it? By, by being open and transparent and by seeking feedback from all stakeholder groups and saying, look, we're all part of this journey. We're all in it together. You know, taking the feedback from everybody and making sure that we can you know, develop that kind of system. And, and now when we went into the second lockdown in, in October, it was almost seamless going from the physical face-to-face -face learning into a, to a a home learning continuity of learning program. Not to say that I want to stay there. I'd love to get the kids back in school because that's what we're all about. But we were much better prepared because of the journey that we've been on during the last six or seven months. Developed, we've, we've developed lots of different things, which again, I think will stand us in good stead in the future. We have virtual CCAs going on every week, which have taken the place of physical CCAs. We've developed a, a website which is called Smarter, Stronger Together, which is basically a well-being website with all different sorts of activities for the community and everybody's involved in populating with that particular website. So really focusing on and drilling down to well-being as being the central feature of how we've, we've come together as a community. So I, I actually think it's been very difficult, very challenging, Hopefully 2020 with the vaccines will be a, a much brighter, a brighter future and we'll be able to move into uh, more of a normal system. Um, but I think we, we'll come out of this and we'll have learned a lot of very important lessons and we'll be able to carry those forward into the future. I'm the world's eternal optimist. Great, thank you. Yes, when I must say I'm picking up um, the heads um, and... Uh, have really risen to the challenge, the leadership challenge across schools and international schools. It's, been, as you say, has been a great role model for everyone. But Joe, what about the perspective, your perspective as a head of early years and primary? Um, and hopefully there are some good things that have come out of the experience as well. 
Well, I, I think we were all tested. Uh, you know, talk about uh, resilience, being flexible, being adaptable, all of these things. Uh, and actually, when this happened, as Michael said, it was overnight. Uh, for us, we didn't have any any chance to plan or, or any warning. Um, that tested the teachers, you know, and um, I, I think the kids were possibly more resilient than we were initially, uh, you know, and I think over time, you know, we learn a lot about ourselves um, in that situation uh, about, you know, we can teach all these things, um, but then when it happens and changes, it's never easy, but it was hard to act. And, and I think everybody, everybody recognized that. And, and it was kind of like, oh, maybe I'm not that flexible. Maybe I'm not that resilient. And, you know, by the end of it, we had a huge, I mean, it was up and down throughout. We, we reopened in May. Um, but, you know, we all learned a lot about ourselves, I think. Uh, and talking about a stronger community, I, I, I think it was Rob who said, uh, you know, we did, we didn't crumble, we shook a little bit. Uh, throughout, um, but we came back stronger, uh, and we came back more knowledgeable. Uh, and and I think that shared experience uh, made the team and, and the whole community uh, much more connected and much more together. So I feel for us in in Vietnam, where we're super lucky, uh, the government uh, really um, came down very hard, and you know I think. We've been COVID free for, I'm not sure how, how long now, but the, the borders are, are tightly controlled. So for us, we're kind of living normally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's certain things, you know, masks and things like that. And everybody's you know, very careful, temperature checks, all those kind of things. But life really day to day is, is pretty much back to normal. Um, apart, you know, obviously we're not able to go outside the country, but we can travel freely within Vietnam. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, we can take the positives out of what happened. Uh, and we've learned a lot, I think, about ourselves, about our kids and about our community and about the, the wider world, uh, I think, in, in light of this pandemic, I think has highlighted quite a lot of issues, um, but also about when it comes down to it, in communities, they're very supportive of each other. And, and, and I think the support that our teachers found for each other, they found for their kids and they found for the, the parents uh, was, you know, probably the biggest thing that came out of it. I, I felt that it really, the innate empathy and kindness of people really came out, so. Brilliant, thank you, great. Well, let's hope that things are going to improve and that 2021 will be a, a happier year for everyone. So let's just look look forward and to the future. So let's hear about your um, aspirations for your school, yourself and the world, if you want. <laughs> um, what, where it, what is it going to mean to be a global citizen? do you think in the future and what part will your school and you pay in it? So shall we start with you, Paul? Yeah, ways that skills with uh, conciliation and you think these are the, the people we need to be world leaders. Um, it's not going to be easy, um, I would say, in the, the decades to come, um, finding solutions to what will be incredibly complex uh, problems that they will be facing um, but it does give you it does give you hope and actually I think often as educators oh. <laughs> well I think I think we all uh, endorse um, Paul's feelings and I'm sure we'll be back in a second <laughs> to, to say goodbye 21 we'll have the kids back and then we can be begin to move from operational which has been 90 percent of, of of the work that i've been doing over this year into more strategic which is linked to the question you're talking about i mean our mission is to uh, develop global leaders who are brave brilliant and inquisitive who are committed to a positive growth of themselves and others then that's our mission statement uh, so you know I, th I think that's what we try to promote through our our mission in the school, which is underpinned by our values. Um, I, I think our skills-based curriculum 
and and the, and the things that we're promoting on a daily basis. I, I often say when you know we get our, our, our parents coming in to bring their children into the EYC, which is the the early years centre that we have. If they if they started this year, 2020, they're going to graduate. If they stay with us for 15 years, they'll graduate in 2035. And uh, you know, it's it's just getting that concept across, and it's been said by many educationalists. We don't have a clue what the future is going to look like, but we're preparing our kids for this totally unpredictable world where, you know, often we said uh, in five years' time, we don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what it's going to look like next year. So it's preparing for the unpredictable uh, through resilience, you know, team building, you know, all of those kind of skills that we're all promoting alongside the academic pathways within the school, which will, 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 will help us prepare for exactly what Paul is saying. That our students can really make a difference you know to the green environment that's one thing we promote garden international is a green school uh, and a sustainable school and we want to make sure that our kids are leaving and preparing not just to take that message but to really make a difference uh, as they become global leaders um in in the in the 21st century so that's my aspiration um and you know i think we all share that really thank you michael what's your perspective no, I think as a school, you know, our, our mission is that our children make positive contributions to the communities and beyond. And I think, you know, one thing I always have said to students, I think it's even more relevant now, is the question that whenever you do something, is that kind and is it making a positive difference? And I think that now even more so, thinking about how lucky we are, and I think about taking stock of the even we've all been involved in this situation, but taking stuff of the good things we have and, and really considering there are a lot of other people around this world that haven't been so lucky. And I think if one thing and take away and what I strive to do and I try to instill in the children is, are we being kind and is it, is it making a positive difference to this world? Because if not, we need, we need to reflect and take stock and really think about what, what we can do to do that. So that's for me is, really, I think forever after this situation is, what can I do? Thank you. And Joe, what's your feelings for the future? Ah, my feelings that are different to my aspirations. I mean, I always <laughs> remain forever hopeful. Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess the big picture uh, in all of this and, and what we're all striving for our students as they, you know, the global citizenship um, is really for them to help. Uh, create, I guess, a, a more peaceful, a more just, a more sustainable and a more tolerant world. Uh, and hopefully through uh, their education uh, and what they experience um, in each of our schools, um, that they can help to promote uh, the, these, these things. Uh, that would be my aspiration. Well, that's a wonderful place to stop. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for your tremendous um, contribution to today. And I would say it's a huge privilege for me, and I would say also for Europe and the UK and the rest of the world to see how wonderfully well you are doing in Asia. I think we could learn a lot from you. And please do keep sharing your successes with our community and, and with schools around the world because you're really doing a tremendous job. So thank you very much. And we'll look forward to keeping up with what your stories are and please do share what's going on. So thank you very much for contributing today to Robert Stitch, to Michael Perry, to Joe Roberts, and finally to Paul Wilson, thank you very much for joining us. So, thank just you. thank you. And that's a good prompt, prompt you. just to remember to please do enter the Relocator Wars when they come up next year. So, here are the um, details of our panel today, which we'll provide to listeners and viewers. And then you'll find contact details of all the schools on this slide, but also in the Relocate Global Great International School Fair pages. And these are some more of the sessions that we've had this week. There's more, there was transition and care and some new research that 
was out that we discussed on Monday and previous sessions on transition care the week before and we got an example of the International School of London talking about their programme next week. If you want to find out all what's happening on a totally online school then do watch the playback of the Bridge School, a fully online education. And then yesterday we had a wonderful discussion with Clarissa Farr about her book the making of us why schools matter and a talk and conversation about single sex and co-ed education which also went way into the future so what to look out for in the middle east africa and europe will be available this afternoon thank you very much again for all of you for joining us there's lots of resources on the relocate global website and into the international education and school fair section which will be on our website for the rest of the year so thank you once again for joining us and thank you and goodbye to our team in asia goodbye